This is what life on an oil rig is actually like. Right now, 142 workers are living on a steel platform 200 miles from shore. For the next 21 days, they won't set foot on land, and their workday is about to begin with a ride that would be illegal anywhere else in America. That cage-looking device being lowered from the crane is called a Billy Pew basket, and it's essentially a cargo net stretched around a steel ring that six grown men are about to trust with their lives. They're climbing in because the walkway connecting their accommodation barge to the platform becomes unusable when seas exceed eight feet. And this morning, the swells are running 12 feet. No seat belts, no harnesses, just rope netting to grip while a crane operator swings you through the air 100 feet above the ocean. The crane operator you see in that cab isn't just pushing buttons. He's performing calculations that would make most people nervous. The supply boat below is rising and falling 15 feet with each swell, which means he has about a two-second window to lift the basket at the exact moment the boat reaches the peak of a wave. Lift too early and he yanks workers off their feet, potentially throwing them out of the basket. Too late and he drags them across the deck, which at best means injuries and at worst means someone goes overboard. On board the rig, those deckhands holding the tag lines aren't just standing around either. Without those control ropes, centrifugal force would spin the basket so much that by the time they reached the deck height, the workers inside would be hanging horizontally, held in by only their grip strength. The entire transfer takes 90 seconds that feels like forever, especially when you realize that if something goes wrong, the nearest Coast Guard station is 200 miles away, and the water temperature is cold enough to incapacitate you in 15 minutes. Once they're on deck, these workers head straight to their assignments, and their first stop for many is the loudest place on the platform. The drilling operation you're watching runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and it hasn't stopped since this platform was commissioned. The crew is connecting another 30-foot section of drill pipe to a string that's already penetrated 14,000 feet into the earth. That's deeper than the Titanic rests. With all that pressure, despite being surrounded in freezing water, the rock temperature at the drill bit is 280 degrees Fahrenheit, and controlling it is where this next part comes in. See that roughneck with the spinning chain? He's about to perform one of the most dangerous maneuvers in industrial work. That chain weighs 30 pounds, and he's going to throw it around a pipe that's rotating at 120 RPM, using the momentum to spin the new section into the connection below. The chain moves fast enough that any loose fabric catching that chain just doesn't end your shift. It could end your life. He'll throw that chain 200 times during his 12-hour shift, and every single throw has to be perfect because a misthrown chain can whip back and hit another worker or wrap around the pipe wrong and cause a catastrophic failure. But that isn't the only thing that can sink the operation on this shift. The brown fluid spraying everywhere isn't just making a mess, it's drilling mud, and calling it mud undersells its critical importance to this entire operation. This fluid, which costs $300 per barrel, and contains a precisely calibrated mixture of barite, bentonite clay, and chemical additives, serves three functions that prevent this platform from becoming a bonfire. First, it cools the drill bit that's grinding through rock at temperatures that would melt aluminum. Second, it carries rock cuttings back to the surface, about 20 tons of pulverized stone every hour. But most critically, its weight creates hydrostatic pressure that prevents oil and gas from shooting up the wellbore. And this battle is a constant one each shift. At 14,000 feet depth, the formation pressure trying to push oil and gas to the surface is 7,000 PSI. That's the equivalent to the weight of three cars concentrated on every square inch. The only thing preventing that pressure from launching oil up the pipe at 150 miles per hour is the column of drilling mud weighing it down. If the mud weight drops by even one pound per gallon, you get what's called a kick, gas entering the wellbore. Drop it by two pounds and you're looking at potential blowout that could destroy the entire platform. But a blowout is just the quick and obvious way that could sink the oil rig. 
there's another much slower, much more dangerous way that once started is nearly impossible to stop. You see, those workers rappelling down the side of the rig aren't adventure seekers. They're rope access technicians, and they're literally the only thing standing between this platform and catastrophic structural failure. The tool making that machine gun sound is a needle gun, and it's firing hardened steel needles at 2,000 strikes per minute to blast away rust and failing paint. To understand why this matters, you need to know what salt water does to steel. It creates an electrochemical reaction where the iron in steel combines with oxygen and salt to form iron oxide, rust, at a rate five times faster than normal atmospheric corrosion. The beam they're working on right now has already lost three millimeters of its original 25 millimeter thickness. That might not sound like much, but this particular beam is part of the support structure for the helicopter deck. Lose another five millimeters and it can no longer safely carry the load it was designed for, meaning your only evacuation route in case of an emergency could collapse into the ocean. Watch how they work after grinding down to bare metal. They have exactly four hours before new rust starts forming in this salt-saturated air. First comes the primer, a zinc-rich coating that bonds to the steel at a molecular level. Then comes the real protection, a marine-grade epoxy paint that costs $500 per gallon and contains sacrificial zinc particles that corrode before the steel does. Even this expensive coating will last two years maximum before UV radiation from the sun and constant salt spray break it down. And then they'll be back out here doing all this over again. But just getting to where they need to paint is a hurdle in and of itself. Notice the double rope system each worker uses? They're always attached at two separate anchor points because salt corrodes everything out here including the stainless steel carabiners and anchors they depend on for survival. Every piece of hardware gets inspected before each shift, a process that may take an hour but could save a life. One corroded carabiner failing means an 80-foot fall into the ocean, and in these waters, that's not survivable. But falling isn't the only danger workers face on board. They also face a constant enemy they can't even see. The hatch you see being opened right now leads to a storage tank that hasn't been cleaned in eight months. Inside is what the oil industry calls sludge, a toxic mixture that forms naturally when crude oil sits in storage. Over time, the heaviest components of the oil sink to the bottom. Paraffin wax, asphalt-like compounds, rust particles from the tank walls, and seawater that infiltrated through valves. This mixture has the consistency of roofing tar and accumulates about two inches per month, left uncleaned, and it will eventually clog the tank's outlet pipes, shutting down oil transfer operations that cost the platform $130,000 per hour in lost production. But the sludge is actually the least dangerous thing out here. The real dangers are invisible. Hydrogen sulfide gas and oxygen deficiency. When crude oil degrades in the absence of oxygen, bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide as a waste product. It's the same process that happens in sewers, but here the concentrations can be lethal in minutes. Before anyone enters, watch that safety technician with the four gas monitor. He's testing for oxygen levels, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, and explosive gases. The hydrogen sulfide reading is what everyone's worried about. At 500 parts per million, you lose consciousness within minutes. At 1,000 parts per million, one breath causes immediate collapse and respiratory failure. The monitor is reading 200 parts per million in this tank, which is why the worker entering is wearing a supplied air breathing apparatus. Inside the tank, the temperature is 115 degrees Fahrenheit with 90% humidity conditions that would trigger heat stroke in most people within an hour. The clearance is only five feet, so the worker spends four hours hunched over, shoveling sludge into buckets that get hauled up by rope because the material is too thick and contaminated for mechanical pumps to handle. Every shovelful releases more hydrogen sulfide that was trapped in the sludge, which is why the safety attendant standing watch never takes his eyes off his partner. 
If that worker stops moving for even 10 seconds, a sign of possible gas exposure, the attendant yanks him out in seconds. When he finally emerges after four hours, he'll go through a 20-minute decontamination process that includes stripping off his contaminated suit, which gets incinerated, and showering with industrial degreasers. He'll still smell petroleum in his hair for three days. The job pays $80 per hour, triple the normal platform rate, because someone has to do it and most people simply won't. And if you thought that job was bad, this other specialty involves doing the one thing most workers are afraid to do. 60 feet below the surface, commercial divers are performing inspections that no remote-operated vehicle can match. They're feeling for microscopic cracks in welds that have been submerged in salt water for two decades. The water temperature is 42 degrees Fahrenheit, cold enough to cause hypothermia in 30 minutes without protection. And visibility is 15 feet on a good day, three feet when storms have churned up the sediment. What he's doing is running his fingers along weld seams, feeling for edges that shouldn't exist. Cracks that might be narrower than a human hair, but could propagate into catastrophic failure under the constant stress of waves and weight. The marine growth he's scraping off with hydraulic tools isn't just unsightly it's actively destroying the platform. Barnacles, mussels, and other organisms trap seawater against the steel, creating oxygen-depleted microenvironments where sulfate-reducing bacteria thrive. These bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide as a waste product, which combines with water to form sulfuric acid that eats through steel at 10 times the normal corrosion rate. A single colony of barnacles, if left undisturbed, can create a hole completely through a steel beam in three years. See those silver blocks the diver is bolting to the structure? Those are sacrificial anodes made of aluminum zinc alloy, and they're sort of like body armor for the oil rig. Zinc is more chemically reactive than iron, so corrosion attacks the anode first, sacrificing itself to protect the steel structure. When an anode shrinks to half its original size, about every 18 months, the divers replace it. This platform has 400 anodes, and without them, it would corrode through in less than a decade. But while these dangers are slow acting, there are numerous emergencies that happen on board where the only help comes from themselves. The alarm sounding now isn't a drill. Someone's missing, and on an offshore platform, Missing usually means one of two things, trapped in a combined space or overboard. Everything stops. The drilling crew secures the well. The crane operators lock down their loads. Every person on this platform is now focused on one task, finding the missing worker. Watch the rescue boat launch from alarm to water in 90 seconds, a response time they achieve through weekly drills. In 55-degree weather, you have approximately 15 minutes before hypothermia makes it impossible to swim. The rescue boat can reach anyone in the water within three minutes, but finding them is the challenge. In eight-foot seas, a human head is visible for maybe two seconds at the peak of each wave. After eight agonizing minutes, they find him. Although this time it was a practice training dummy, next time it could be real. But once they recover a casualty either from the water or from an accident or injury, the battle is far from over. The platform's medical officer, not a doctor, but a paramedic with advanced offshore medical training, now has to keep this worker alive for the next 90 minutes until a Coast Guard helicopter arrives for medical evacuation. Here's how that evacuation works. The helicopter can't land on a platform during a medical emergency because it needs to keep rotors running for immediate departure. Instead, they use a rescue basket, similar to the Billy Pew, but designed for one person lying flat. The medic secures the casualty to a blackboard, then into the basket, which has a special frame to keep it stable during the lift. The helicopter hovers at 150 feet while the hoist operator lowers the basket to the helideck. The platform crew loads the patient, and the hoist operator, who can lift 600 pounds, brings them up in about 45 seconds. The nearest hospital is 200 miles away, and in rough weather, that flight could take two hours. If the weather is too bad for helicopter evacuation, 
that worker stays on the platform with a paramedic trying to keep him alive until conditions improve. After 12 hours of this each day, workers return to the accommodation barge, where 200 people live in conditions that would make many prefer staying in jail. The rooms you see now are called four-man cabins, which is a generous description for spaces the size of walk-in closets, where grown men sleep in bunks packed so tight that when you lie down, your nose is exactly eight inches from the mattress above you. Each person gets one locker the size of a gym bag for 21 days of clothes, toiletries, and whatever entertainment they brought to maintain their sanity. The bathroom situation is where things get genuinely rough. 40 men share two toilets and two showers, and the shower schedule is treated with the seriousness of a legal document. You sign up weeks in advance for your five-minute slot, and those five minutes aren't continuous. It's 30 seconds of water to get wet. Then you turn it off and soap up in the dark. Then another 30 seconds to rinse. Miss your time slot because you were working late and you're waiting another day or trying to trade shower time like it's currency, which out here basically is. The galley serves four meals a day to accommodate the rotating shifts. And while oil companies learned decades ago that good food is essential for morale, there's a catch. By week two, everything, the eggs, the steak, even the coffee, tastes vaguely like diesel fuel because the ventilation system pulls air from everywhere on the barge, including the engine room. So by week three, when the fresh vegetables have long since rotted and everything else comes from cans, meals become less about enjoyment and more about fuel for the next shift. Now it's 10 p.m. and exhausted workers are trying to sleep while the platform continues its 24-hour operations. The drilling never stops. That constant vibration travels through the steel structure into every bunk. The accommodation barge is connected to the platform. So every time the drill string adds another section, a crane moves a container or a pump cycles on. The vibration pulses through the sleeping quarters. Workers stuff earplugs deep into their ears, but they can still feel the platform working through their mattresses. This is the most dangerous time. Most major offshore disasters happen at night when exhausted workers make mistakes and when a small problem compounds into catastrophe because the people who would normally catch it are asleep. The night shift is the skeleton crew. Fewer eyes on gauges, fewer hands to respond to emergencies. And history shows what happens when things go wrong on an oil rig at night, they go south really fast. The footage you're seeing is the deep water horizon burning. The blowout that destroyed this platform started at 9.45 p.m. the previous night when most of the crew was either asleep or watching TV in the accommodation quarters. Those aren't just water cannons approaching that rig. They're specialized firefighting vessels, each pumping 10,000 gallons per minute of seawater at a platform that's already lost. The water isn't extinguishing the fire because you can't put out burning oil and gas with water. They're trying to cool the steel structure enough to prevent immediate total collapse. Notice the distance those boats maintain? Nearly 500 feet. Any closer and the radiant heat from that fire, which is burning at over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, would ignite their own fuel tanks. Steel begins losing strength at 800 degrees and loses half its load-bearing capacity at 1,000 degrees. Those platform legs you see glowing orange are already compromised, bending under the weight they're supposed to support. Despite pumping 40 million gallons of seawater over 36 hours, the platform sank. Every single safety procedure you've watched today exists because of disasters like this. That worker spending four hours in 115 degree heat cleaning toxic sludge, he's preventing pump failures that could cause pressure buildups. The rope access tech who spent 12 hours fighting rust on a beam that looks fine, he's preventing the structural weakness that could cascade into collapse. Every seemingly mundane task workers carry out each day is potentially the only barrier between survival and another deep water horizon. Bye for now.